of the world that, uh, that professor uh Chinedu Afi Bomba and uh, and the team uh, have been doing and so much value has been added to uh what we stand for as Jackson Heights through uh the effort that the PID have uh, uh, provided um for us to all grow on we do not take it for granted we really do appreciate it. um <clears throat> let me say that i am actually quite fascinated by the track we're going to be traveling today uh, you know in uh, expanding our understanding of how to uh, generate uh more information through research for what we do now this is coming at a very very uh, important time in the history of communication for a civilized existence. Um, I say this because, as some of you may know, I'm, I'm speaking from Washington, D.C. Uh, I just finished a breakfast meeting with um, a friend of mine of more than 30-something uh, years, um, a well-regarded professor here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, in Washington, and we're talking about uh, literally the state of the world and the challenges that face humanity. I mean, they are anxious because they see America as literally in decline, in, you know, uh, facing the decay of sorts um, because of the way that communication has shaped rational conversation. Um, I have myself been um, particularly interested in the last couple of years by the work that has been done at the Center for Moral Cognition at Harvard, where, um, you know, they have tried to bring together um, psychology, um, philosophy, and neuroscience to understand the huge gap that is developing between reason and emotions and the way choices are made in society. Uh, from my friends in the political science and uh, the, the gentleman I, I met with at breakfast and I spent a bit of time talking about the work uh, by political science professors at, at Harvard, some of them have been doing recently uh, Steven Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, you know, have written this book, uh, Is This How Democracies Die? Uh, very interesting uh, uh, that um, a book of a similar title came out of Cambridge as um, a chap who's head of politics and history uh, at um, Cambridge, who's called uh, Ron Seaman, Ron Seaman's own book. Uh, uh, is this how democracy ends, you know? Uh, um, basically, uh, um, these people have been concerned about how communication and um, behavior come together and actually enable a democracy to foster dictatorship. A lot of people forget that Adolf Hitler was elected and a good part of the nationalist movement in Europe with Mussolini and co came from elected officials and where it took Europe down the track of authoritarianism. As some of you may know, the subtitle of my last book, uh, Why Not, was uh, Citizenship, State Capture, uh, Creeping Fascism, and the Criminal Hijack of Politics in Nigeria. Uh, and these are real concerns. And communications experts who do not find ways of researching appropriately to locate the base of how these things influence choice and the kind of society uh, uh, um, that we evolve into uh, will be challenged. And this is why I'm, I'm enormously grateful for um, the work that uh, this series has been about and how it has brought us to this very important uh, 
conversation uh, amongst those who are speaking to us, who will be learning from uh, old colleagues and friends. Uh, he's mentioned Professor Charles Okibo. And um, of course, we have from our own, the, from the stable itself, back at the Suka, uh, several of the interventions. But I think that is important for practitioners out there in the field to recognize the development of uh, a research uh, uh, um, approaches to help the work that they do in making some sense out of our world that tends towards nonsense. Uh, but I am very, very trustful uh, that they will, um, you know, provide a hearty guide to, to us. Once again, I want to welcome everyone and, and say that I am um, all prepared to learn as much as I can and um, in the end, <coughs> see how this can help us create a better society uh, than our children had because that must be the duty of every generation to make their shoulders available for the next to stand on so they can see tomorrow more clearly. I thank you all so much for being part of this. And I thank our moderator, Capo de Chito, Capo Mafioso. Bro, <laughs> 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 Oh my no, God, thank you so much, man. Great pleasure. Okay, Prof, thank you so much for that. Uh, Welcome address and the context of today. Uh, the insight is quite uh, deep. Uh, we appreciate you for that. Um, without much ado, I think we can proceed. Uh, but before we do, let me let down some little more ground rules. And uh, that is to say that th this program is actually supposed to take just about one hour or thereabout. We have done about 15 minutes. Um, we think that uh, the coming presenters will be doing between 10 minutes and a maximum of 12, 13 minutes. And then at the end of it, um, responses or other questions or comments can take the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, we hope that we can keep by this time. So on that note, I want to invite the next presenter. And uh, that is from the HOD of Mass Communication, University of Nigeria, Suta. I think it's ably represented by Uchenna Jonathan, who is going to give us a kind of a holistic or an overview of that department. So uh, I welcome you to listen to that wonderful presentation. All right. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Uchechuku Jonathan Eze. Now, standing in for my professor and the head of our department, Professor uh, Joseph Mogu. So uh, my, my presentation uh, is on uh, mass communication, investor of Nigeria and Soka, a histography as put together by my HOD. So here we go. The introduction, we have chapter one, filling the gap. Mr. L. Oro, the Soka record, first graduates, and then um, from four to thousands. So we are going to break this down without uh, wasting uh, any time. So the next slide, please. Sorry. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So at uh, the Jackson College of uh, Journalism, University of Nigeria, Suka, was established, like we can see, in the year 1961. So the college came at the inception of the university to fill the gap created by the departure of some foreign journalists and the need to sustain social communication in the then burgeoning political landscape. It's also very important to know that um, the college was named after uh, John Payne Jackson, a courageous newspaper editor who founded the Lagos Weekly Record. And that, uh, that was uh, in 1891. So up to date, students and graduates of the department 
are still called the Jacksonites. So next is, um, we have to understand that uh, at the time, at exception, the college had only Mr. L. O. Ro as both the head of the department and the only academic staff to teach the students who qualified at the time. So let's move on, let's move on. Okay. So we go to the Suka record. As you can see, Okay, so the Jackson College launched the Nsuka record as a weekly publication in 1962. But the international orientation of broadcasting may have led to the change in the name Nsuka record to just the record. And so uh, the crusading journalism quit the roots of the Southeast region at, as it did in 2000 and 2010, which thoroughbred political mockraking prepared by first-class student journalists like uh, Mr. Mayo Ikoroha and then now Mr. Uh, Chidebiro Machuku respectively as the then editors. So let's move on to the first graduates. Next slide, please. The first graduates. Now, it is interesting, it's interesting to note that uh, the university at the very inception had just four graduates. And then um, worthy of mentioning also are the pioneer students from the pre-1967 era, which include uh, people like Silvano Sequelier, Chineme Agomba, John Anameleze, Roy Eze Basile, Tony Momo, Chris Dohuje, Rafa Nijikwe, and so on. All right, so from there we move on how the college was able to, you know, move ahead from just four to thousands, millions of graduates today. So following the historic convocation in 1964 has been the betting of millions more, beginning with the trickles of 12 graduates in 1965, 12 also in 1966, and then 15 in 1967. And from then, it has been success all the way. So let's move on. The next slide, please. Okay, so we go to the uh, post-war stories. So it was in the year 1971 that the production of the first badge of the department's post-war graduate emerged after the wreckage of the war. That time also the department started its Masters of Arts program in mass communication. And so the National University Commission, and you see in the, in the late 80s set new standards for departments of mass communication in Nigeria. And so print journalism being in the kitty, the standard laid emphasis on electronic, electronic journalism, marketing communication, philosophy of communication, history and development of mass communications, mass media systems, mass communication research and theories and photo journalism. So of course, this formed the fulcrum of curriculum review in 1990, which was widened even the more in another curriculum review in 1998 to cover new media-based platforms, digital reporting and information and communication technologies, that's ICTs in general. Okay, let's move on, let's move on to the graduate programs. Now, the postgraduate degree programs was established in the department in 1983. And interestingly, the pioneer students were Dan Okolo, who is now with Mad, uh, Madol, who is the CEO of Madol Press Limited Abuja, and then Mrs. Angela Agada Uya, the uh, retired director of Federal Civil Service, who now lives in Abuja, and then Uche Abo, Corporate Affairs Department, NDC Portacot. We also have uh, Abdul Karim Amosun. Also in that list is Abdu Abdurrahim Abrahman, the founder and CEO of Jerin FM. 95.5 in Lauren. And the last, not the least, of course, is uh, Onyebuchi Oyempa. Also very interesting to note is the area of, uh, you know, brilliant lecturers they had at the time. And then these names, of course, are very, very synonymous with mass comm departments. As you can see, like Professor Kwele, Professor Demele, Professor Chudo Kongo, Professor Chasto Kibo, Dr. P.C. Abba, 
And then uh, Mr. Tien for Bodo. Let's move on. How did the departments break through the barrier of PhD program? So there was a high expectation from every zone in Nigeria for the departments to float a doctoral program in mass communication. First, of course, the department was the first in the country and the natural feeder of virtually all the others after it across the nation. Secondly, the department boasted of PhD holders by the 1980s up until the early 2000s. Well, it even had a professor, some of who had to mount the program as well, leaving us doctoral offers. Nevertheless, Dr. Nanyelugu Okoro fought like an agitated great lion and selflessly royal a PhD program back into life. To date, the department has graduated over 40 doctoral candidates since 2012, when it broke the boogaboo of PhD production. And so let's move on, let's move on. Let's go to, <clears throat> okay. Let's go to the, the chapter three, that's the Jackson Professional Development Series. Uh, for the want of time, so let's move on, okay. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide, please. Are we there? Okay, good. Okay, that's chapter two. We have the Jackson's Professional Development Series. So indeed, we have grappled with problems of facilities and high profile staff over the years, but we have confronted them gratefully especially the letter. As we make this move, we call on all involved leave to show us support. The Jackson mm -hmm. Association World, worldwide, ably led by Professor Pat Utomi, are living in a feasible fit in this regard. However, there is still a grappling shortfall in the facility, in the facilities of teaching and learning. Now, moving on is the building projects, the new Jackson home. We have secured a land to build our faculty of communication, while a committee has been set up for the attendant designing of new programs towards unbundling. As we move on, we keep seeing hope and fulfillment on the horizon. So thank you so much. All right. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much, Mr. Uche Chuku, Jonathan, for that wonderful presentation. And uh, it's, a, it's a historical uh, discussion on the department, uh, which is very important for everybody, particularly the younger people coming in, so that they understand the context and the history behind the department. I'm sure that uh, for the want of time, there's still so much to be said. So thank you so much for keeping to time. It's about uh, a little above 10 minutes. Um, I want to crave my indulgence to agree how to proceed, either to make our comments or questions now, or after all the presentations. I'm asking my coordinator, how do we proceed? Uh, we'll take the questions like... at the end. We'll... Okay, we'll take the questions at the end, okay. So I'll urge people to note their questions and comments. Please don't forget them, they're very important. Uh, so that immediately the last person speaks, then the questions will start rolling in. Once again, uh, we appreciate uh, the HOD, we appreciate Mr. Jonathan for that presentation. Okay, the next thing on our agenda this evening is the next paper. It's a kind of uh, an overview also by Professor Okolo. Uh, we are going to be listening to the PhD students of that department, Francisca Obobe, who is representing the prof. Um, I'm sure Francisca is ready with the presentation, yeah. please. Thank you so much, come, come on, please.
We're waiting for you. I'm here. I said good afternoon, yes. everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Greetings to everybody. Yep. I'm on the challenges and opportunities of a postgraduate studies in a mass communication in UNA. But before I start, I need me to introduce our father in the department, the grand patron, in the person of Professor Nanyelu Ugokolo. As we know, he is a senior staff and a professor in the Department of Mass Communication, UNN, and has been teaching postgraduate and uh, undergraduate students for 28 years and postgraduate for 15 years. So in the course of his teaching and research, he has been observing with keen interest and concern the challenges as well as the opportunities that are the path to knowledge generation and knowledge sharing in the teaching and research process. So on Professor Kuri's behalf, I thank our mentor, Emeritus Professor Charles Okibo, and our very own Professor Chinedua Fibomba for putting together this webinar on mixed method research for our postgraduate students through the instrumentality of Jacksonite Professional Development Series. I know about the time, but within the time frame, I pray I will be able to cover. Outline, please, the slide, outline. My outline is the challenges of postgraduate communication in postgraduate studies, strengthening postgraduate studies in mass communication UNA. So the challenges, the challenges, I can't see the slides. Hello? Am I here? Yes, we can, we can hear you. We can hear you. According to Mutuna 2011, postgraduate studies are conceived as notes through which universities build research capacity and develop relevant skills for addressing developmental and their societal problems. So, as observed also by since in 2006, research at this level, therefore, is a hands on mechanism by which postgraduate students learn how to conduct systematic investigations based on works carried out by researchers and scholars in the field. So in order to extend the current state of knowledge, it is unfortunate that the quality of teaching, learning, and the research at undergraduate level constitutes a weak foundation for postgraduate study. So challenges are lack of students' interest in research, which deadens curiosity, zeal, focus, and rigor, which are germane to the research project. Next slide, please. So also in the poor quality, also is the poor quality of students admitted into the postgraduate uh, programs, which eventually results in students dropout from the programs along the line. So is it the problem of uh, working and studying at the same time and the uh, students inability to strike a balance between work and study? which uh, has given rise to the visiting student syndrome or that of wrong choice of research topics arising from poor literature said by students. So now coming to the students inability to submit their works in record time to supervisors and the, that of their manifest impatience in not giving supervisors time to go through their submissions weighs down supervisors with um, excess administrative uh, duties. Sometimes as well supervisors are even too busy to attend to their supervisees. So again, is the student's lack of interest in applying themselves to the rigors of the demands of grant writing. Therefore, perfunctory and Sarah uh, Peter's presentation of the research philosophy and their process to students, which kills interest in the course as it creates the impression that research is a hard nut to crack or even a kind of a uh, rocket science. So non-use or poor use of library resources as a result of um, library illiteracy is another problem or, or challenge. Absence of research resource center in the department to facilitate access to data gathering, that of data analysis and robust research communication, positive of updated journals to keep track of research trends in the field. Again, it's near absence of motivational, uh, near absence of uh, motivational support to teachers and supervisors in form of a prompt payment of supervision, honoraria, and their sponsorship to international seminars. 
also is out of a uh, workshop and conferences to align faculties and uh, knowledge and expertise with global scholarship and uh, innovation in um, research methodo methodology and investigative skills. Next slide. So also poor coordinated approach to project and the TC supervision as a supervisors and supervisees work in silos up to proposal defense. That of poor application of team teaching and team supervision method hampers the concept to teach and that of uh, innovative uh, critical thinking. Again, is the absence of collaborative research to enhance interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary studies. Lastly, but not the least among the slides, so last but not the least, on the challenges is lack of prompt invitation of examiners, uh, these external examiners to examine students and uh, the students' projects and thesis. Again, is that of delays from external examiners and lack of prompt settlement of external, external examiners. Next slide. The opportunities. Notwithstanding the above challenges, there are so many opportunities for postgraduate students to tap into to make their studies a history experience. Today, government is recognizing the need to support studies at postgraduate level in view of the prime importance of such manpower at the level of national development. So over the years, there is increased international support for higher order research from agencies like the Overseas Development Agency and the, that of national bodies like um, Tertiary Education Trust Fund. Through such agencies, international and national funding for postgraduate research is made available to students. For instance, in 2020-2023, 5,500 plus research grants, that of small grants funding, has been advertised for individuals, research scholars, and organizations to support research in the physical sciences, that of arts and humanities and social sciences. But in 2020 and 2021, third fund through the research, um, through the National Research Fund, released the sum of 7.5 billion and um, 8.5 billion respectively to promote research and uh, development. For instance, the 2022-2023 um, 5,500 plus research grants, uh, research grant funding has been advertised for individual and even researchers, scholars and organizations to support research in the physical sciences and all whole laws that I have um, mentioned earlier. But in 2021 alone, 10th fund disbursed the sum of 300 billion to 2020, uh, 226 uh, treasury institutions for staff development uh, and the infrastructural development. So the call for proposal for 2022-23 in funding has already been advertised. Next slide. So other sources for postgraduate funding include international and national charities and foundations, employer funding and their sponsorship, as well as crowdfunding. Students can uh, also tap into the opportunities to take care of their tuition fees and living costs. But unfortunately, many postgraduate students are not even aware of these windows, not to talk of um, how to profit therefrom. Also, these days, the bugbear of research has been reduced to the barest minimum by the increasing availability of credible uh, sources of data and new knowledge. More than ever before, students can easily access a plethora of journals of all knowledge used in science, arts, technology, and the professions, as well as e-books, dissertations, and theses, thanks to digital libraries. So according to Mutuna 2011, with the availability of open access to new knowledge, Scholars and researchers now keep an eye on what their counterparts are doing elsewhere, thus enhancing collaboration, sharing of knowledge, and best practices. Strengthening, um, next slide, please. Strengthening postgraduate studies. Postgraduate studies and mass communication in the University of Nigeria is a success story, despite the challenges and merited above. The foundation of this success story was laid by the communication luminaries who ran the studies as it, at its inception in the early 1970s, when the master, um, in the 1980s rather, when the master's program was mounted. They are Professor S.A. Idemili um, Ekwelie, Dr. F.S.O. -so Idemili, R.C. Wankwo, Professor, uh, Professor P.C. Aba, Professor C.C. Okibo, 
ENM Merije and Dr. Obodo. Also, we will not also forget those that laid foundation for the School of Journalism then, now the Department of Mass Communication and the person of Dr. Thomas Aworo Mwangwene, Ms. Dezenteze, and that of Dr. Ray. So in the early 1980s, precisely 1983, the department admitted the first set of uh, master students, about um, 10 persons, meeting the demands of the job market. So in 2006, 2007 session, in order to meet the demands of the job market, the PGD and the PhD program took off the same session, admitting about 13 and five students respectively. That's 13 for PGD and um, five for PhD respectively. So since then, the University of Nigeria Postgraduate Studies in Mass Communication has been in the forefront in relation to other institutions that run similar studies. So in fact, as of today, I'm happy to announce that about 40 students are in the pipeline for PhD, 37 for masters, and nine, nine students for PGD program in the department. So in fact, um, in the face of uh, this success story, however, there is still room for improvement going by the challenges outlined above. For instance, there is urgent need to set up a digital resource center in the department to remove the drug area associated with teaching, research, and learning. It is also vital that teachers and supervisors see themselves as co-learners and researchers to establish a climate environment for robust research and scholarship. Also vital is the creation of windows for training and the retraining opportunities to be in tune with the currencies in the research and development process. Finally, both teachers and students should be um, pro-professionalism as one cannot give what one does not have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Francisca. So one thing you have kept to time, uh, we appreciate you, appreciate very valuable insights and uh, you know the knowledge you've given us about the opportunities and the problems in the department. I know there are more, but because of time, we can't take all. Once again, thank you. And we thank uh, Professor Nanyomigo, of course, for that uh, elucidation and train up issues that probably we didn't know about. I'm sure that as time goes on, the Alumni Association will look into all those things. They're already looking into it. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good. OK. Whether that people have been using, but we need. I think we might have a little bit of a technical glitch there because we can't hear Chooks. Uh, my name is Chine De Umba, and I'll, uh, I'll take over until Chooks is able to join us. And so the next speaker we have for today is uh, Professor Charles Okibo. Uh, Professor oh. Okibo will be speaking on why mixed methods research. And so at this time, please join me in welcoming Professor Okibo. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of my experiences of teaching and practice of research with you today. I thank the organizers for making it possible for people from indeed all over Africa. I can see from the registration list that we have participants from Ghana, from Kenya, from all across Nigeria. And I'm happy indeed to be sharing my experiences with you today. My short presentation is on why mixed methods. Why should we be teaching mixed methods today? 
And in doing that, I would like us to, to talk about what is mixed methods and then talk about the scope of mixed methods and how we do it and conclude with some examples. So let's, let's move on to why mixed methods. In fact, the short answer to that question is, why not? Why not mixed methods? Or we can elaborate and say there are five reasons why we should all be thinking more seriously about mixed methods today. The first is that it is timely. It is about the newest trend in social research. We didn't have it 30 years ago, but since the early 80s, there has been a new emphasis on combining quantitative and qualitative research. And that has led us to refining this approach so that today we now have indeed a new research method that is like the third leg of the tripod. You have quantitative, you have qualitative, and mixed methods is like the third leg. And it's the newest. But it's not because it's new that we are preaching that we adopt it. It's because it is the best way to study complex human behaviors, particularly in this multicultural and global age. There are many things that are defined using only qualitative methods or only quantitative methods. And we have found that the best way is to combine them. But it is combining them, not in a convenient way or not in an arbitrary way, but in a strategic and reasoned approach. Mixed methods is also necessary today because we are dealing with more curious students. In the marketplace, we are dealing with more curious consumers who are asking more questions today than in the past. And to address those questions, it's important for us to go beyond using just quantitative or qualitative approaches. It's better for us to combine them so that we can complement the advantages of one with the advantages of the other. And by so doing, we come up with results that are more useful than if we had used only one method. Indeed, we can see this new approach as a new language for management consulting. And as you well know, management consulting is the practice of involving professionals to address problems we encounter in our daily life and in our professional activities. So management consulting, the professional approach to solving problems, it's something we encounter almost everywhere. Management consultants like APMG, Arthur Anderson, they are all required to help us manage many of the problems we encounter in our daily life. Problems like university enrollment in higher education, election campaigns in situations as we have in Nigeria, raising funds for various organizations. So problem solving is a uh, practice of management consultants. And in doing that, we find that mixed methods it's a good way to do it. Now let's talk about what mixed methods is. Next slide, please. What do we mean by mixed methods? Mixed methods is simply combining qualitative and quantitative research methods. But as I said before, not just because it's convenient, or not because it's possible, but because it is uh, measured it is reasoned, it is justified, and it is strategic. It is strategic because we don't just use any available qualitative method. Or do we use any quantitative method because it sounds sophisticated or because we are familiar with that? Or rather we choose the qualitative and the quantitative methods because they are the best 
can use in addressing the problems at hand. When we use mixed methods, it's more than just using multiple research methods. So mixed methods requires us to integrate, requires us to find a way to combine qualitative and quantitative, quantitative in a complementary manner. Next slide, please. By mixed methods, we mean that there must be an integration. There are three aspects, mixed methods that we need. The first is integration. We need integration. We must combine them in a strategic way. Secondly, when we do that well, it will help us to draw inferences from the integration. So the result of our integration is to draw inferences. And when we do that, it will lead us to having unusual insights from our data. So those three criteria are important in our deciding what qualitative and what quantitative methods to use. We need to integrate to show that we are not using them arbitrarily. We need to draw inferences to show that we are getting unique responses and unique answers to our integration. And the two will lead us to have insights beyond what can be learned from using qualitative and quantitative. Next, let's talk about how much weight should we place on quantitative and qualitative? How do we balance? Next slide, please. How do we balance the combination of qualitative and quantitative? There are various approaches, but I agree with John Cresswell that to be even-handed, they shouldn't give undue advantage to either qualitative or to quantitative. Ideally, we should try to use both of them equally. And when we do that, we won't be showing ourselves to be supporting or to be favoring one over the other. To remind you again, mixed methods use means combining qualitative and quantitative approaches. But in a strategic sense, it requires integration. Let's now talk about the scope. Where can we use mixed methods? The simple answer is in any field that we are interested in coming up with useful results from our research. So mixed methods are appropriate for us to use in the arts and humanities. They are applicable in the social sciences. We can use them in education. When I give you the examples I have used to illustrate uh, the application, you'll find that many of them come from education. It can also be used in the health sciences. Health sciences. Mixed methods are appropriate for use in environmental studies. They are germane in our studies of the sciences too. Science, technology, engineering, math and medicine, so, as I said before, mixed methods are useful in every domain, every aspect. Now, let me go on to how do we do mixed methods research? How do we do mixed methods research? We do mixed methods research the same way we do ordinary research. And we are concerned about using data to provide answers to research questions. The difference, however, is that with mixed methods, we want to make sure we have quantitative and also qualitative data. And these two sets of data will be integrated. It's good to have the title uh, using the words mixed methods. The examples I will give you now will show that very often people who use mixed methods want to indicate their use of mixed methods in the title of their research. Secondly, we define the problem clearly so that there will be enough grounds for us to see how to use quantitative and qualitative data. And then thirdly, we identify the goal. What is the purpose of this research? And what are the objectives? What are the specific reasons why we are doing this research? Ideally, we should have research questions so that they will provide the framework for our analysis. 
And it's good also to have hypotheses, especially in those areas where we are familiar with the trends. And so we can hypothesize the kind of results we expect. The lead review is similar to what we do in, our, in all kinds of research. And then the qualitative and quantitative data will be selected based on how we define the problem. Our definition of the problem will guide us to decide what kinds of quantitative data we need and what kinds of qualitative data we complement the, the data we already selected. And then we go ahead and collect and analyze our data. And the key aspect of mixed methods is interpretation. What do the results mean? What are they telling us? And that's where integration comes into play again. We encountered integration in our design. Now in the interpretation, we also employ integration to show what kinds of results we are getting from the qualitative and how these results complement what we got with the quantitative. From interpretation, we like to bring in a theoretical explanation because this is not research done for the sake of research. It's not research that is pedestrian, but it's research that is very often informed by a theory. Or if there is no founding theory to inform what we are doing, we can use a um, branded theory approach to come up with suggestions of the kinds of theories that can apply, that can be used to explain the phenomenon we are dealing with. And then second to the last, we write up our results as we usually do. And finally, we make sure we disseminate. Let me now go on to give you three examples, three examples of mixed methods. And uh, these publications will be available on our website so that in two days time, you can go there and download any of these examples I've given you. The first example was published in 2013, and it's on using mixed methods for graduate engineering students to show that mixed methods is appropriate in various disciplines, even when we are studying engineering students, how to retain them in universities. We can use mixed methods to come up with more interesting results than if we use only qualitative or quantitative. The second example was published in 2017, and it is about how students know so, uh, scholarly communication. What undergraduate students know about scholarly communication? And uh, again, you can see this is published by people who study library, li librarianship. And uh, it's published by the library and the academy and intellectual journal. And then the third example is more recent. It was published last year in Health Communication Journal. These three examples show you that mixed methods can be used in various fields. Indeed, in any field where we are interested in finding out useful results from our research. Now, let me conclude by reiterating that mixed methods approach is highly recommended, particularly for master's and doctoral students. Why? because they yield results which are more useful, which are better, which address issues better than if you are dealing with only qualitative or quantitative data. So mixed methods, they trump use of multiple methods, they trump use of only one method, and they are always recommended almost in any discipline, but particularly in communication and education. I want to conclude by saying that mixed methods may sound difficult, but indeed, it's not. It's not more difficult than when you use a simple method. It's not even more tedious, and it's not more time consuming. Indeed, Chuk Semwerem, the moderator here, has already used mixed methods in his doctoral research. And um, he came up with results which are better than if he had used only quantitative or qualitative. Finally, this is the millennial age, and young millennials are taking center stage 
both in politics and in higher education. We expect them to adopt mixed methods research more holistically and more convincingly. And so we look forward to months and years ahead of seeing many of you here today using mixed methods in your research and also in your management consulting, consulting practice. And so I want to end by once again thanking all of you for giving us the opportunity to introduce you to mixed methods. And I want to appreciate Professor Pat Tommy for joining us today in spite of his very busy schedule. So it's with lots of gratitude, a sketch of gratitude, and we welcome like Pat Tommy and identify with his interest in making sure that the Jonah the Jackson Ice Professional Development Series continues to grow from stage to stage. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Jukes. Oh, very good. Thank you so much, bro. I think Thank we. Thank you, bro. It is also yeah. around about this place. Okay, bro, uh, as usual, that's a very deep one, very insightful. We couldn't have expected anything less. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I don't know if my coordinator wants to say something before we proceed. Professor Mba? Are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry. Do you mind repeating the question? I'm having a bit of a difficulty here technology wise. Uh, okay, what was the okay. question? I, I just appreciate it, Prof, for that deep insight you're giving to us about mixed methods and the fact that uh, uh, the method is really catching on and uh, telling the youth, the young ones, to you know catch the trend. And that's the trend these days. And I said, we seriously appreciate him. As usual, he has come out you know, better than before. So I just thanked him for that. I said, do you have anything to say before we move to the next uh, uh, agenda, which is to take comments? I know just to echo your thoughts. Yes, thank you. And it's such a privilege to have both yeah. uh, Professor Kimo and Professor Tommy uh, as part of this uh, as we would say back home, August occasion, <laughs> although it's thank in you. July. But thank you, yeah. you go right ahead. Okay, um, thank you everybody. We have listened to that very robust uh, lecture. Well, we, we don't see Okibo as a lecturer, he's a teacher. And uh, when he teaches you, you cannot uh, but understand everything to the letter. I have enjoyed it so much. I've been using mixed method but he had just let us understand that you don't just use it. It has to be strategic. It has to be measured. It has to, you have to know what you're doing so that at the end, you know that you are getting to a, a predestined objective. Once again, thank you, sir, for that uh, <clears throat> elucidation. So we move to, uh, as we put it at the beginning, we have had three presentations. Um, uh, we'll go this way. Well, if you have anything to say to uh, Jonathan, who made the first presentation about the uh, departments, let us know. Uh, you may use your physical hand or your electronic hand to indicate. And um, please let everybody mute him or herself, because in the last 10 minutes, there's been some background noise that has been very, very uh, inconveniencing. So please mute yourself. And then if you have any questions for Jonathan, you let us know. If you have questions for uh, Edna, um, that's Francisca, please let us know. And then finally, I know the questions for Prop will be much more robust. So I'll keep the door, I mean, the floor open now for anybody to say something. If you'd like to ask a question, you can either uh, raise your hands using the Zoom function or 
Or you can feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question or make your comment. So, yeah, uh, has, uh, is on up. Can we okay. take your question? Ophelia, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I have to start by thanking all the presenters for a wonderful presentation, especially the last presenter that dealt on this uh, mixed method. Actually, all of us most time were confused on this issue of mixed method, particularly when it comes to analytical tools and how you analyze the data, especially the qualitative. Analyzing quantitative data is much easier. So most of the problem we encounter is on how do you analyze this qualitative data and now integrate it with the quantitative data you have. So mine is more of actually aim my ideas and if this platform can help us or teach us further into how we can employ analytical tools in terms of qualitative data and see how we can now integrate it into quantitative data. Uh, okay, thank you, Ophelia. I think your question is well noted. Um, are we going to take the answers immediately? Perhaps, yes. Prof. Yes, I think that makes sense. All right, if yeah. Professor Kibo won't mind. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. And uh, I appreciate the, the question because it's something that every researcher grapples with. Even when you are not doing mixed methods, if you are doing multiple methods, which is combining qualitative and quantitative, often in an arbitrary sense, or just because it sounds more sophisticated, or you want to show off, not necessarily because it's strategic. But when it's strategic, that's when it is mixed methods. We keep emphasizing that. And then the challenge is integration. How do you integrate your qualitative and your quantitative? It begins with your goal for the research. What is the purpose of this research? If the purpose is to explain more than to uh, build on a theory, then you are going to de depend more on qualitative. And even though John Cresswell says we should balance, it's not necessarily always the case that you should balance. In mixed methods, we deal with where do you begin and where do you end? What is the primary and what is the secondary? Or are they all equal? And as Ophili said, very often the challenge is in, now that you have those two results, how do you integrate them? It begins with well, your like design. It begins with your design. It begins with how you frame your question. It begins with the goal. What is the purpose of this research? Which leads you to the objectives. Objectives are also the same as your research questions. In fact, many supervisors will require you to use what they call parallel research questions, which means you provide one objective, and then you attach a research question to that objective. But the, the research question is parallel to the objective. Then if you can even go further and pro provide a, a, an hypothesis based on your objective and your research question, which means you know a lot about this problem and you can even hypothesize, this is the kind of result we are going to get. When you are at that level, it's easier for you to know what kinds of qualitative answers you will use to complement your quantitative answers. And it's easier for you to know what kinds of numbers you, you will use to justify the kinds of qualitative responses you are getting from your respondents. So uh, there is no hard and fast rule about what qualitative analytical tools to use. The critical thing is for you to know that qualitative answers are usually explaining. They are giving you what people think more than quantitative numbers which are telling you precisely this is what is happening with the phenomenon. And then secondly, these days, because many of you are millennials and you are more comfortable with computers, even with qualitative research, we now do have many qualitative software like in vivo, class TI, that can be used to support your critical analysis. 
the most important part of qualitative research is you are using your intuition, you are using your native knowledge, you are using your in natural intelligence to explain what you think is going on because you are not relying exclusively on numbers. You are using your understanding of the context. But these days, computers can also help us to support what we are doing or to say that what we are doing might not be the only way to see the problem. As in many social science research, we are very often not too categorical. We are providing these answers in the hope that they will help us enlighten the problem. We are not saying this is the only approach. So hopefully to answer your question, uh, the design, the way you conceptualize the problem, the way you design the collection of the data, the amount of weight you place on quantitative and qualitative, and the kind of theory you are hoping to come up with, even if you are the first person to come up with that kind of explanation. All these will guide you in deciding how to make sense of your qualitative data. And that's all we do in qualitative research. It's using your native intelligence to interpret what they said, but to interpret what you found. And being able to find some theoretical support to underline what you are finding. And even when you find what you didn't expect, that's even very important because that's how you come into new areas of new, of new knowledge. So whatever you find is significant, not in the statistical sense, but in the sense that you didn't know this answer before you came up with these results. So it's uh, using your common sense, using your number six, looking at what other people had done and being able to marry the qualitative and the quantitative. I hope this is helping you, hopefully. Thank you so much for your explanation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. I'm sure Philly has gotten the message. So, any other person? Yeah, we've got a techno. Uh, there's no name. It's uh, techno uh, has uh, his hand up and he asks a question. So, perhaps techno could unmute and ask the question. Techno Paul, um, the question is in the text. He says, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Prof. Please, regarding the mixed method in research, what are the obvious challenges for a young researcher? Okay, I think the obvious challenge is uh, anxiety and thinking that it's difficult, but as I, as I said in my conclusion, mixed methods is not necessarily more difficult. It's not tedious either. And it's not more time consuming. These are the challenges that novices might expect. But as uh, Chuk Zengwerem here will confirm because he has used mixed methods, it's, it's not more difficult. And those challenges can are encountered in every kind of research. So mixed methods is not more demanding. Uh, it's not more difficult. If anything, it's more exciting because you are looking at digging up answers and solutions that you think would be better than if you had used only one method or the other, or okay. if you had used both methods but arbitrarily without thinking thoroughly at the design stage, that these are the kinds of answers I expect qualitatively. And these are the kinds of results I want quantitatively so that when I integrate them, they will yield me answers that would be better than if I had used only one type. So the challenges are not real. Actually, there are no real challenges. That the same challenges you encounter if you are doing mono method, using only one method. The challenges of thinking that data are difficult to collect, that data are difficult to analyze, and after the analysis, I wouldn't be able to interpret what I got. These are problems, challenges we encounter every day. So with mixed methods, not more challenging. 
all you have to do is make up your mind and be convinced that you are coming up with results which have practical implications okay. because you are combining qualitative and quantitative in a strategic sense, in an integrative manner, and not arbitrarily just because you want to show off uh, uh, by convenience because it's possible for us to get qualitative answers and combine them with quantitative answers. So there are no serious challenges in mixed methods, which you don't encounter in simple one method research. So don't be, don't be scared. You actually, many of you are already doing it, even though it's by accident or by default. And in many cases, it's what we classify as multiple methods instead of mixed methods. Because you weren't careful at the design stage to say, these are my qualitative data sources, and these will be my quantitative data sources, and I need to combine these two so that I can answer these research questions more precisely and in a more interesting manner. Another reason why we do uh, mixed methods is because of the value of qualitative research. In qualitative research, you are bringing intuition, you are bringing in your narrative skills, the way you tell stories, the way you use stories told by other people as data for your research. So it makes it more interesting, makes it more, more exciting, it makes it uh, easier for people to enjoy. And it's not just full of data, full of statistics, full of uh, graphs and, and uh, visuals. Yeah, but rather, we are thinking about what's the narrative approach that can let us draw our audience into the stories that our research are providing. Thank you very much for your time, Prof. Okay, thank you, Techno. Um, we also have another person. Uh, I think this uh, is it Edna. Somebody's hands was were off. Happiness, are you there? Happiness, you wanted to ask a question? Okay. Happiness, Perhaps, would you yeah. like to unmute? Is it Edna that is the same person? I guess not. Well, we'll just go ahead if uh, uh, there's Mohammed. Mohammed has uh, his hand up. Yeah. Okay, Mohammed. Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Okay, hello. Like hello. Go ahead, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe my question might be a uh, little bit somehow. Maybe I came late. I joined the, the session late. How about the question is, uh, Samsung the most woman. I read, I read uh, something about uh, mixed methods where you can convert uh, qualitative data to quantitative. So my question is, are there uh, provided a procedure like models or approach approaches that are available for converting the quantitative qualitative data to quantitative to ensure the reliability because the issues of quantitative data there are issues of reliability and validity of the data so while converting the qualitative data to quantitative are there models that the researcher is supposed to follow in order to ensure the reliability of the data he has collected and converting from qualitative to quantitative? Well, in, in many cases, you might not have a serious need for conversion. It depends on what you are aiming at. Uh, there is a reason why you collected qualitative data. And the reason is different from what you have to do to collect quantitative data. In quantitative, you are looking at more precise measurement. In qualitative, you are looking at exceptions or um, what people think. And in that case, you are not looking at precise measurements. You are looking at 
descriptions of people's feelings. And those feelings might not be precisely measurable, but it's interesting for us to, get, to describe them and know what they are, and know why people felt that way. Yeah, so the conversion will probably be unnecessary. But if you have to do it, then you'll be guided by the reasons why you are converting will lead you to what methods can you use to convert. I don't know of any models that or frameworks that will make you uh, convert every qualitative data to quantitative. Yeah, because in many cases, by collecting those two kinds of data for different reasons. And then the reasons will guide you to make use of the type of data you've collected for the purpose that you collected them. And very often the purpose will not include transforming one into another. So, as I said in my presentation, the approach in mixed methods is always guided by the goal you have at the beginning. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because we want to have a more holistic understanding of what's going on. And to do that, we need some numbers so that we can have precise measurement. But at the same time, we need some qualitative data so we can describe what we think is happening and, and, and in an interesting manner. The, the purpose is not precision. The purpose is comprehensiveness. The purpose is to provide a different hue to the statistics. And therefore, uh, you have two different purposes that will not call for you to convert one into another. Mohammed, okay. you, can, you, can, you can, can respond back if you want. And uh, you no, can be oh, no. more precise in your question. No problem, sir. I, I think I'm okay with the explanation. It's just okay. that I'm so curious about what I read about that model of transforming one qualitative to quantitative before you make your final analysis. That's why I ask whether there are available frameworks for doing that. But I, I think the explanations is uh, are okay for, for the question. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Mohammed, okay. may I ask, where are you where are you participating from? <laughs> Mohammed, where are you located? Hello. Jukes, go ahead. I think yes, you University of Madhu Okay, okay. 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 I'm a there. student of Professor Wilson. He's with all the decisions. I can see his name. <laughs> Good yeah. evening, Prof. <laughs> Our regards to you guys in uh, Medugri. We sympathize with you over the tension in your area, and we are happy you were able to join. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much for your care and concern. Thank you so much. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Baratala Salihu, is your hand up? Do you have a want to ask a question, Salihu? Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. All right. Good evening, everyone. And um, we thank Prof for his wonderful presentation and all other presenters as well. This is wonderful and uh, we really appreciate it. Um, my question is, um, when using mixed method, how can one select a fitting title of his um, uh, maybe dissertation or paper? Uh, if I get the proof well, it means a topic can be identified to either be suitable for mixed method or not. So how, what was the yardstick? How one can measure uh, the title of his research to be suitable for mixed method or otherwise? That's just my topic and my question. Thank you very much. That's Thank a good you. question. And as I said during my presentation, very often we want to include mixed methods in the title, but we don't have to. You can, you can be silent about your use of mixed methods, but very often because mixed methods is new and we like to advertise that our research is about this new topic, we like to put it in the title. And then the title is like the headline of the story. The title is comprehensive, it tells us what you are doing, but more importantly, it's attractive. It flags us down. If there are 10 titles, we want people to read our own title and even go beyond reading the title to read our research. 
So the title is important. It contains all the keywords on the problem. It, it makes it in such a way that it's intriguing. It's inviting. It's, it makes people curious. What are they doing here? What are they asking mm -hmm. here? And, and then, as I said, if you like, put a semicolon and then put mixed methods. The three examples I gave you, uh, you see that they have mixed methods. But there are others which don't have mixed methods. Uh, coming up with a title mm -hmm. is like coming up with the, with the headline for a new story. And there are various ways you can structure the headline, but a good headline does three things. First, it tells us what the story is about. It doesn't mislead us. Secondly, it tells us this is an important story. It's topical, it's news. You have to read it because it's topical. And then fourthly, it's, it makes us curious. We don't, we don't know, we are not exactly what is happening. Yeah. And these are the three uh, factors you take into consideration when you're coming up with the title of, of your paper. But you know also that the title can also be the last thing you do. That you have a working title that guides you to identify the goal, the objective, the research question, the hypothesis, data collection, analysis, interpretation, and then maybe at the last minute, you can reframe it and come up with, by dropping or adding a few words, you come up with a new title. So the title is not uh, always written in stone and can never be changed. Usually it's good to have a working title that is guiding you. And then at the end of the day, you come up with the final title. And in your dissertation or thesis, it's good for you to agree with your chairperson and, and they will guide you. They will help you formulate something that meets all those three criteria I gave you. Yeah. Are you from Medugri too? No, I'm from Zamfara State. Oh, Zamfara, good, yeah. good. Good. <laughs> okay. Prof, you have a choice now. Yeah. So we've okay. got uh, Prof, Edna I have a question. and Ophili. Uh, yes. Edna? Yeah, this is Edna. Good evening, everyone here uh, in this uh, conference. Um, I think uh, mine is just uh, an acknowledgement. I acknowledge uh, Prof. So, Kibo, so much. Why? Because I'm, uh, I belong to that mixed paradigm, the mixed paradigm shift. That is where I actually belong to. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to mention so many points as uh, strategic integration and uh, inferences. Because while teaching in my, in my class, I, I actually do that. When I tell my students that uh, it is really good to use mixed model for inferential statistics for that if you're going to make inferences some of them will frown at it but uh, i believe and uh, i am so happy you actually mentioned it today and uh, i have a just one question on this on your presentation i want to know whether we can use this mixed model approach to validate our instruments if we can use the mixed method approach to validate our instrument to know whether the quantitative instrument we are using or the um, qualitative uh, instrument we are using which one is more valid or authentic in our research if we can use it that way so that is my question prof thank you very much yeah instrument validation is an aspect of research and Every aspect of research benefits from using mixed methods instead of just one type of method. So if you are validating your instrument, we usually do it quantitatively. But it's possible for you to enrich your finding by having qualitative support for your quantitative validation. So your, result, your results will be more authentic and more convincing if you use mixed methods, because you are not relying only on statistics and numbers, or rather you are lending support to, the, to those statistical analysis and the results with qualitative insights that you, collect, that, you, that you gather from your qualitative data. So yeah, in every situation where you are dealing with research, mixed methods will be better than if you used only one approach. 
many cases, you don't have to use both qualitative and quantitative. But in any situation where you are do doing qualitative, the results will be richer if you had quantitative. Similarly, if you are doing purely quantitative, the results will also be richer if you find costs to add relevant. Relevant, that's why we say strategic. Strategic means it's necessary, it's needed. It's, we are not doing it because it's available. We are not doing it out of convenience. We are not doing it out of tradition, but it's relevant, it's strategic. So your results will be richer if you can do that. I think uh, Professor Mba is planning to have us uh, have discussions beyond these webinars, have online discussions. When we get to doing those discussions, I will give you examples of dissertations done here in the US that were qualitative, but they were enriched with some quantitative data. So that you find somebody writing a dissertation in history. And in fact, a good example is Ralph or Conquo, Professor Conquo, who taught at, at, the, at the Department of Mascom UNN for many years. His dissertation is qualitative because he was talking about press laws. But at the same time, he provided abundant quantitative evidence to support what he was saying qualitatively. Yeah, so. Edna, you can always yeah. try to use both methods when we are validating our instruments because the results will be richer than if we use only quantitative. Okay, Prof. Thank you. So All right. Okay. Thank um, so much. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you, Prof, for always making things clearer for us. Any other questions? We've got, um, we've got, Ophelia, your hand is up. Uh, I don't know if it's from the first question or you have a follow-up and we still have happiness. Uh, happiness, yeah, I have a follow-up, follow Ophelia? Okay, yeah. great. So how about uh, a quick one and then happiness and then uh, after that, uh, Jukes uh, will round up and uh, I'll make the last comments and we'll we'll call it a day. Thank you. Go ahead, Ophili. Okay. Thank you, sir, for giving me another opportunity to ask question. Uh, my question mm. is still on this issue of using mixed method. Uh, for instance, the problem lies on transcribing your responses from your participants or from your respondents. Let's assume in your quantitative research, you have a sample of about 450 participants you know, by the data you'll be able to analyze. But then we have limited number of qualitative data you can collect from such a, a sample because there's no way you collect responses from 450 participants. Basically you have to use the focus group. And I don't know per se, do we have a limited number of focus group to be to, from where we can co collect our qualitative data from in any research? And then again, after collecting this qualitative data from this your focus group, how do you transcribe? Because there is tendency that some of these participants may sway you away from your objectives and research questions. So how do you transcribe to, be, to align it with your research objectives and, uh, and the research questions? Thank okay. you, sir. Okay, good question. If you have a sample size of 450 for your survey, obviously you will not use every respondent for your qualitative data collection. You are going to use a smaller sample size for the qualitative because it's more cumbersome to interview people. Um, you gave the example of focus group discussion. Focus group discussion is where you are selecting eight to 10 to 12 people because of their common, common criteria of being the best informants for the subject you are studying. Focus groups are good, but they're not the only, only sources for qualitative data. You can as well use in-depth personal interviews. And that's what Chooks and Werem used. Instead of a focus group, 
I will require you to put six to 12 people together in one room and have a discussion. You can decide to interview some people, maybe six of them, maybe 12 of them, maybe 20 of them, but not 450. Interview them in depth. That's what we call IPI, in-depth personal interviews. Based on the research questions that are guiding the conduct of the study, you go and interview these people one after the other. And in fact, after you've interviewed one person, you can ask them, who do you think I should talk to next? And that's what you call the snowball method. So that one interviewee will guide you to another person who is equally qualified or somebody who has a different point of view. I've interviewed APC member, and then I asked them, who should I interview for the PDP? They can direct you to who you interview. So definitely because it's uh, qualitative, you are not going to have a, a large group of people supplying you the answers you need. How do you analyze? There are various ways to analyze. Those of us who are old school, will use color markers to read their responses and then be able to put them in groups based on the questions we ask. So their answers will now lead us to group them, make sense of what they told us. But as I said during my presentation, uh, or during one of the answers, these days there are softwares we can use to do qualitative data analysis. In vivo and Atlas GI are the most popular. And I believe uh, as we do these monthly webinars, we will have one webinar devoted exclusively to in vivo. And then we have another month devoted exclusively to Atlas TI. So that at least we have three different methods of doing our qualitative analysis. The old school method of using color markers to do it manually, and then it makes sense of what they told us. And now the new millennial method, of using the computer software to do our analysis of the qualitative responses we got. But the, the, the joy of qualitative research is in the interpretation, in the making sense of what the respondents told you. There are no right or wrong answers. It's the stories you, you try to tell from the responses you get. And then how they make sense because of the theory informing the subject of your study. There is no correct answer. There is no wrong answer, as long as you are trying to interpret what they told you. So, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, but I think it's, uh, who asked this question? Edna. Is hopefully, hopefully. Okay, hopefully, oh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah, second question, yeah. Um, okay. Thank you so quantitative, much. Quantitative, you have no problem with that. Qualitative, uh, in addition to FGD, you can do in-depth personal interviews. And then in fact, you can, you can in fact come back to the interviewees during the analysis stage. As you're analyzing, you are coming up with what you didn't expect. You can go back to them. That's the joy of qualitative research. You can't do this with quantitative. You go back to them and say, this is what we are coming up with. What does that mean to you? So there are various iterations of collecting data in qualitative research, not just one time. And it can also be consulted when you are interpreting. When you are interpreting, you can go back to them and say, this is what we found. What does that mean to you? And then you can incorporate their, their interpretations in your own interpretation of what you found. Yeah, so uh, very interesting. And the, as they say, the, the pudding is in the eating. Uh, we are hoping that in the next few months, many of you will be so absorbed in doing mixed method research that you will find opportunities to do it everywhere. And we recommend that you think as management consultants, not just as academic researchers, particularly for these, my friends in Zamfara and Medugri and uh, BUK. We hope you'll be seeing yourselves more as management consultants, as problem solvers, so that your research is not just necessarily to meet uh, uh, an academic requirement, but rather it is to address the problem, is to come up with solutions to these social problems. Next month, the topic for our webinar is action research. Action research is the kind of research you do 
in a serial manner. So you don't just collect data, analyze, write up your report, and that's the end. No, it's cyclical. That's why we call it action. So next month will be action research. You collect data, you analyze, you provide results, and then the results will lead you to collect more data, which you analyze and pre present second level results, which will lead you again to collect more data. So that's the topic for, for next month, action research. It will, be, it, will, it will tie nicely to mixed methods because we want to involve, we want to use mixed methods in collect, collecting action research data. Thank you for your questions. Jukes. Oh, Jukes. Jukes, Dr. Muted. Ham, I think we may have a Jukes technical hitch right there. Dr. Worm, okay. are you muted? No, I won't say no. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, everybody. I don't think there's any other questions coming. Uh, we have happiness. Happy, happiness, are you there? Happiness? I guess not. Um, uh, okay. Ademokai, uh, Jama, would you mind muting, please? Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Chooks. Uh, let me know when I can speak. Thank you. Yes, we are really uh, rounding up gradually. Um, like we said at the beginning, this is the first of this, uh, you know, this lecture series on the research methods. Uh, it's been a very wonderful period of time. I'm sure those that are tuned in from all over the world are happy with what has been done. So in conclusion, uh, maybe my presenter wants to say something before I conclude. Uh, otherwise, I would say, uh, like the prof has already said, this is the monthly webinar, every first Friday of every month. Uh, Professor Kibo has just given us a tip uh, <clears throat> that next week will be, I mean, next month will be the uh, title of the action research. And I think it's also going to be stimulating. Uh, so we look forward to that. Uh, so far, so good. We have had beautiful discussions from the uh, discussion or presentation from the HOD up to the presentation from Professor Okolo. And finally, the re research method. Um, I think uh, we've done it. And we are so very grateful to all that attended, but I want the coordinator to do that uh, bit of maybe thanking our uh, participants, including our very senior colleagues. Professor Mba, please. Okay, thank you so much, Chooks. Um, and yes. thank you everyone who's here with us today. Uh, before I thank uh, Professor Kibo, I'd like to speak to what the next steps would be. And so uh, the series we've started today, Mixed Methods Research, is under the brand Knowledge Hub. And Knowledge Hub is one of the initiatives, or one of the brands of Jackson's Professional Development Series. It's uh, the baby in the stable. The special thing about Knowledge Hub is that it is committed to academic capacity building. And we are blessed to have resource persons like Professor Kibo, uh, Professor Nayun Bokoro, and many others that we will be inviting to be part of this session. And so this series will hold first Friday of every month. So keep an eye out for uh, the email and uh, the WhatsApp information. Now, there is an exclusive group for anybody who has registered for this event. However, to be part of this exclusive group, you have to go back to your invitation and join the WhatsApp group. 
The fun thing about this is that it gives you a more intimate opportunity to interact with our resource persons where you can direct your questions and get one-on-one -on -one responses. And so I would encourage you to go back, join the WhatsApp group, in, introduce yourself, and we will post many more resources beyond what we have shared today at this session. A number of people have asked if we are going to share the slides used today. Yes, we will share the slides and we will also share a link to the recording of this session so that you can access it. And, uh, and so on that note, I'd like to say keep an eye out for the next invitation with information on our next seminar, which is the first Friday of next month. Uh, join the WhatsApp group if you want to continue the conversation and get a, a little bit more extra uh, support on uh, such research subjects. And then finally, I'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to try to grow yourself because we know this is all about the knowledge economy and uh, we need this knowledge to build our country and the world. I'd like to thank Professor Kibo who gives so selflessly to anything that has to do with capacity building. Uh, he just does it so passionately and makes it seem so easy. We know it's not easy. We'd like to thank Professor uh, Patu Tommy, who always answers when we call. And Chooks, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this as a moderator. I know you'll be joining us again for uh, the rest of the six series we have under the research uh, seminar. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing up. And uh, that's it for me. And uh, Chooks, over to you. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Yeah, Please, before you, so you log off, sorry, Chooks, one more thing. When you log off, there is a survey that would like you to fill out. If you don't mind, respond to that survey. It's really going to help Professor Kibo and all the other resource persons in supporting this conversation. Now and over to you, Chooks. Yeah, Prof, thank you so much for that wonderful, you know, concluding part. Uh, I just wanted to add to all the participants, particularly the people from far-flung places, that if you really have enjoyed this, I think, uh, Prof, they can share to other colleagues who would not, who would, uh, who would like to be part of it next time. That's just what I wanted to add. Uh, we'll continue to grow the, you know, the participation because, uh, it has to do with capacity building. So I'm, I'm hoping that next time uh, the, the membership, the participation will also grow beyond what you have today. So um, on that note, I think we've done so well. I also have to thank everybody, thank my coordinator, Professor Mba, Professor, uh, Professor, the two other pr uh, presenters, we thank you so very much because it has also shown other people what happens in our dear alma mater, uh, Department of Mass Communication. So on that note, I want to thank you and wish to see you again in 30 days time. God bless everybody. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the yes. day. Yes. Bye-bye.